Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, our series continues The Hungry Estate. In this episode, the fisher folk can't seem to make a living. In Southern Gardening, Eddie's yearning for ferns, three chances to go green in the shade. Back on our series in Mississippi Waters, almost a zero harvest. And in our main feature, the 2024 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. So good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. This week, we continue our Emmy-winning series, The Hungriest State, with two more segments, examining the lives of those who make their living on the water, fisher folk. In the first segment, we meet Frank Parker and Maria Tran, for whom making ends meet on Mississippi's Gulf Coast is now easier said than done. My name's Frank Parker and I'm a uh, sixth generation commercial fisherman from Biloxi, Mississippi. I absolutely knew I was going to be a fisherman forever. I mean, I can remember as a young child, that's all I ever wanted to do was fish, you know, whether it was uh, crabs or fish or shrimp, I was going to be on that water. I've known that my whole life. I started commercial fishing by myself when I was 13 years old, uh, running crab traps before and after school. So, I mean, I've been running these waters for 38 years now, you know? So, to me, it's kind of, you know, I, I know the, this water like the back of my hand. Thank you. 
this is 30 and 10, 30 and 10 is 40. My name is Maria Tran. I'm a mom of eight. <laughs> eight. <laughs> I have eight kids. Yeah, it's four boys and four girls. And shrimping, I had shrimping was not my plan. <laughs> Thank you, be 40. Yes, ma'am. Enjoy your crab, okay? Yes, ma'am, thank you. You take care now. Thank you. <laughs> what was the plan? My plan was to get a good education and be a doctor like every normal kid. <laughs> Cause I, I, when I came over in 1975, I was only four years old. Most of the people that built their shrimping business that came over from yeah. Vietnam had no mean of, you know, of, uh, English, the language barrier, education. So the only thing that keep uh, make a living out is the shrimping. And shrimping is, for them, they pick up really fast. Yeah, they love the hard work because you make money and, and they could support the family. There's, there's two types of sh uh, shrimp. One that goes out for a month that stayed out of money. And those are the people that, uh, that can make the money. Because they stay out there for a whole, whole month, they collect, you know, they hit and collect, 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 and accumulate the shrimp, and they come in and they sell to the factory. With us, it's local, we like to sell all fresh. And we only kick over at like at nighttime, but we leave the dock at five, and comes in at 7.30. So this, you know, you don't have enough time. So we catch as much as we can and supply our customer, the local, with fresh shrimp. And with just all this rain, it's making it very hard. <laughs> making it very hard indeed. We'll have more in just a few moments. On the lighter side, the enigmatic fern, a popular accent plant and very tolerant of low light, which makes it one of Eddie's favorites. This week we show you a super collection for your garden. You know what I mean, Fern? Today, Southern Gardening is back at Coach's Cedar Creek Farm in Lucille, Mississippi, checking out some of their beautiful shade garden ferns. We can grow many different types of ferns in hanging baskets and containers throughout Mississippi, but when it comes to planting ferns in the ground, the list is much shorter. Let's take a look at some ferns growing here in the greenhouses that would make great additions to a shade garden. One of my favorite ferns, Autumn Fern, is a bold and beautiful choice for a shade garden. It is a low-growing, frilly fern. The fronds of Autumn Fern start out as a green coppery color, maturing to a deep green color in summer and fall. The Japanese Holly Fern is a lush and attractive evergreen fern that is a popular choice among gardeners and landscapers due to its distinctively glossy, dark green fronds that resemble the leaves of holly plants. Another great shade fern grown here is the Southern Wood Fern. The bright, light green fronds have a delicate, lacy appearance that are supported by a woody stem. The leaflets of the fronds are arranged in pairs along the main stem of the frond. Each leaflet is lance-shaped and has a serrated or toothed edge. The leaflets become smaller as they move up the frond. These three ferns would make a great addition to any shade garden. Consider adding them to yours. I'm Eddie Smith and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. Time for a short break right here, but stick around. Coming up, this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. Zach and I partnered up for this one. More than 1,200 4-H and FFA members competed for slots in the sale, showing nearly 2,100 head of pigs, sheep, cattle, and goats. 
Plus, we talk to Emma Grace Putnam, a hardworking young lady from Sunflower County who showed her champion lamb in the sale. A record setting event, the 2024 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Back to our series, The Hungriest State. More about why Mississippi's fisher folk are facing such hard times. We pick up with Ryan Bradley, who says the long slide downward started with one of the largest natural disasters ever to hit the Mississippi Gulf Coast. So here in Mississippi, uh, we've had a plethora of man-made and natural disasters. Uh, just looking back in recent history, it really started with Hurricane Katrina. That knocked out about half of the uh, commercial shrimp fleet. Then we had the BP oil spill in 2010, and that really has decimated our wild oyster reefs, which is uh, one of the biggest fisheries on the Mississippi coast. We've had next to zero harvest for about the past 10 years since the BP spill. But then we've been plagued with these Bonnie Carey Spillway disasters, which we had one in 2016, we had another one in 2018, again in 2019, and in 2020, with 2019 being a record opening, a uh, record number of days it was open. And so we just, uh, you know, these guys are tough, these, these families are tough, but there's only so much you can take. And, uh, you know, they've been dealt uh, a very tough hand. Right there, look, dead stingrays, dead catfish. Our season this year in our inshore waters between Louisiana and Alabama, it's probably been the worst year I've ever seen in 30 years. And uh, the main thing is just with the amount of fresh water we've had, we've had excessive rainfall, you know, every, all throughout this area. So, but it's been, it's been really, really bad. Too much water will create the uh, imbalance of the pH meaning the, uh, it's going to kill the fish, shrimp, you know, or to drive them further out somewhere. And we're not able to make a living out of it. And I think it was like two years ago, when they opened the spillway, there was a lot of, what, algae? See, that's, a, that's you know, caused algae because the, uh, the pH in the water is not uh, consistent. We had a lot of pollute. They kept calling it fresh water. Well, when that was that was water out of the Mississippi River that comes from the the 
from Minnesota all the way down the Mississippi River, and that is polluted fresh water. It's not fresh water, it's polluted fresh water. And because we had all that polluted fresh water with, with all these uh, chemicals in it, it caused some major blue-green algae uh, blooms, other algae blooms, and it, it, it put a tarnish on our seafood, you know. The jumbo kind. I need a jumbo today. Those are a little bit too big. Yes, we are sold out on the small medium this morning, yeah. but this is the only thing we have left for the day. Yeah, that's. Yeah. You don't have anything there. Uh, on the shrimp? No, not right now. Oh, you yeah. Will, you think you will later on today? No, not quite. Hopefully tomorrow. What we've seen here over the last several years is due to all the plethora of disasters that we've had. The productivity of the fishing vessels have fallen off. The consistency of the availability of the product has fallen off. And because of that, you don't see people looking for product uh, to buy fresh shrimp right off the vessels as much as you would, say, five to ten years ago. Do you ever feel pressure? Like, are you ever worried about are you worried? When you wake up in the morning, are you like, man, I hope we sell enough today? Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, yes, I do. I do. Yeah, how are we going to pay the bill, you know? Yeah, I give up everything to, like I said, um, I give everything up to concentrate on this job. And now, the, you know, too much rain, it's just, it's just very depressing when you go out there at night and you're catching less than 100 pounds. You can go all night and not make it up. You don't even catch enough to make up for the fuel and ice. It's feast or famine a lot of times, and you have to have really good money management skills because sometimes you make really good money, you know, when you have that money in your hand, it's like, oh, we're going to buy this, buy that. Well, there's weeks where you're not going to make a whole lot of money, you know. This year in particular, I, I haven't worked hardly at all on my shrimp boat just because it hasn't been economically feasible, you know, uh, when it costs you with the... The price of fuels went up this year substantially since last year, and but the price of shrimp is up, but it's still not enough shrimp to catch to make it a bigger profit margin. That's why I've been crabbing. The overhead's a lot lower, so the profit margin's bigger. look at global market factors that have uh, impacted the seafood industry on, here on the coast. The, the importation of shrimp, farm, mostly farm-raised shrimp uh, coming from overseas from other countries has really uh, put a lot of pressure on the shrimp industry in particular. We, we normally would see shrimp prices much higher than they are now 30 years ago. For the past 30 years, Fishing, especially shrimping, here in the U.S., here in the Gulf, is very difficult. We have to spend so much money to fill up the uh, diesel tank to go out the fishing for four days, six days. And then when they come back with their catch, the price is too low. Sometimes the sale that they get out of the catch that they get out of the reception has been enough to pay for the diesel. Now, why is it that prices are going down? We, we know that for a fact. More than 90% of what we eat here in the U.S. is imported. And foreign countries, they have lax regulations. They can do whatever they want, as long as they satisfy paperwork and produce those products at very low cost to so bring them in here. Uh, a lot of these imports that come into the country, they're subsidized by their host countries uh, where they're being produced. So that allows them to put them on the market much cheaper and undercut our fishermen here in America. And, uh, you know, when a state where everything is, uh, prices are inflating across the board, uh, the cost of materials and supplies uh, are, are rising uh, with your product, uh, being stable or even decreasing, uh, it makes for very tough market conditions. You know, it's just hard to compete 
with rise in operating cost on a global market. You know, there's still countries over there where people can make a dollar a day and they're doing good. And it's just hard for us to compete on that level here in, in the United States. Hard to compete, hard to watch. We'll have more next week and more on that shortly. In this week's feature, the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, we cover it every year, one of the state's biggest livestock events, a chance for 4-H and FFA students to showcase their award-winning animals. At the end of the day, it's not about winning or losing, it's about being able to wake up and the responsibility that comes with it, knowing that that animal is something that you've worked hard for, and if it wins, if it loses, you've raised it, it's alive, you've done the hard work, and it's all because of you. Responsibility, a word that pretty much defines Emma Grace Putnam, a 16-year-old junior from the Mississippi Delta. This is her fourth year of the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. She's been showing animals for 10 years. Uh, my brother and my sister are older than me, so I kind of got into it as pre-4-H at our county and district show. And as soon as I came of age to like legally show, I started and never fell out of love with it. It's one of those things that if you start, you just get addicted. It was another great year for the Dixie National, a record-breaking year in fact, grossing more than $484,000 on 53 animals sold. 39 scholarships were awarded, totaling $61,500. For all the 4-H and FFA kids involved, it was a magnificent chance to shine. And for Mississippi's Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson, a chance to brag on these kids he and so many others hope will stay right here and flourish at home in the Magnolia State. And I want to suggest to you that this is the best youth development and the best workforce development program in the state of Mississippi. The youth livestock programs with 4-H and FFA, the great work of Mississippi State University, the extension agents, and the ag teachers out there in every county. And today we celebrate the culmination of their hard work. These are the young people who are our future leaders. If you want to see the future of Mississippi, you look at these young people here today. The work ethic and drive of these young people weren't lost on Angus Catchot either. He's the new director of Mississippi State University Extension here at the sale for the first time. Because Extension oversees 4-H, needless to say, he and the rest of Extension have a vested interest in seeing these kids do well. You can tell the responsibility of raising animals has resonated through the way they carry themselves and they're going to be productive in the workforce as they graduate and move on because the skills that they have, that they've learned through this, is going to, is going to resonate throughout their career. Alex Deason, Emma Grace's agent from Sunflower County, couldn't agree more. He's been working with her since she was eight years old and couldn't be prouder of her effort and success. For her, he says, 4-H was the key. It rewards the kids that put in the work ethic like Emma Grace and many others that you see absolutely love the program and gain so many benefits, responsibility, leadership, work ethic, all of it. It's just rewarding to see these kids be able to surprise everybody with what they do in here. This year, Emma Grace had a lamb in the sale of Division I Reserve champion named O'Malley. She had support from her sister Lily, who aged out of 4-H herself a couple of years ago and now attends Mississippi State. My sister has been the biggest influence ever in my life. She's the only person I can look at and say, I want to be like her when I grow up. And for me, I will never be able to let her understand how much I appreciate that and how much that helps me in my life. O'Malley brought in $8,500 in this year's sale, but for Emma Grace, who plans on attending college and vet school one day specializing in animal reproduction, it's not about the money. For her, there's a deeper meaning behind it all, just one of the things she likes so much about raising sheep. Even on the bad days, it's always something that you can just go and work with. and. Even when they're not setting up perfectly or they're not eating their feed right, it's always going to be just get it, just get it done. There's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. And for me, I, I, don't, I just I love sheep, and that's just something I always have. 
I guess watching them from the day they're born is just comes with a little more love and compassion. Emma Grace has come far in her young life. Like so many young people at the Dixie National, she's accomplished much. Even so, she also knows there's much work ahead and she'll love every minute of it. There's so many things that I've learned as far as responsibility, leadership, sportsmanship, like being able to feed an animal. I think that all of these things will come into my life in the future and I'm excited to see where it'll take me. Congratulations to Emma Grace Putnam and to all those young people. Well done. Well, next week, our concluding segments of the Fisher Folk, all part of our series, The Hungry Estate. We talk to Frank Parker and Maria Tran and others about what the future is already looking like for Mississippi's fishermen. It's not necessarily a pretty picture. The graying of the fleet and the possible collapse of the Mississippi fishing industry, part of our series, The Hungry Estate. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. See you next week. Thanks for watching.